Good evening, once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. Going to do another video this evening talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy, but first a word of prayer. Father, again, I just, as I look at the news, I see so many signs. The world is a mess. There's chaos everywhere. The signs are all around us. That something big is going to happen and things are going to change. And I just pray, Lord, that you will use this message to speak to people's hearts and to prepare them for the return of Jesus Christ. And to prepare them for whatever is about to happen on this earth. Strengthen our faith and use this video to save the lost. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, uh, well, uh, again, I just I have a lot of news stories tonight. Um, it's, let's, let's, let's pretty much get right into this. But uh, all of these stories tonight, well, not all of them, but s several of these stories have to do with things going on in America and some things that uh, Barack Obama is up to and well, again, Pope Francis and the one world government and the one world religion and the United Nations again and the LGBT agenda and on and on and on, the peace agreement. There's so much stuff going on. Supreme Court rulings. But what I got in my mind right now is <laughs> judgment is coming to America and it's coming very soon. How long can we keep poking God in the eye with a stick before his patience runs out. I can't help but think it's not going to be much longer. And uh, this first news story that I want to cover tonight. Wow is it a good example of this. Uh, I've done several videos in the past talking about our military. And how God has been removed from our military. How uh, chaplains can't even pray in the name of Jesus anymore. Uh, you know, they're, they're getting threatened with court being court-martialed for using, for preaching in the name of Jesus, for using the Bible, for having Bible verses stuck to their computer. We are removing God, not only from our military, but absolutely from our society as well, from the school system. But while we're removing God from the military while honoring Islam and their rights we're also celebrating the LGBT agenda in the military and uh, this this first uh, this first news story this headline is just amazing it says and this is out of now the end begins army general army general introduces his husband at 4th Annual Pentagon Gay Pride event. First of all, would there ever be a Pentagon Christian event? At this point, I would have to say, absolutely not. As I just said, they're removing God and Christianity from the military. But this is the 4th Annual Pentagon Gay Pride event. The Army General introduces his husband. I ha again, I mean, if we get involved in a conflict, is God going to help our military? I begin to wonder. Let's look at this. The Pentagon Gay Pride event kicked off with the national anthem sung by the Rock Creek Singers who are with the Gay Men's Chorus. Again, now the end begins always includes some scripture, so I'm going to go to that. Romans 1, 26 and 27. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. To, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their heir which was meet. It says, a married army general on Tuesday introduced his male spouse at a Pentagon gay pride event. 
that featured lots of top brass, including Defense Secretary Ashton Carter as the keynote speaker. Uh, <laughs> what made this seemingly routine introduc introduction noteworthy is that Brigadier General Randy S. Taylor introduced his husband, Lucas. My husband, Lucas, is sitting up front here, General Taylor said of the man in the same row as Mr. Carter, Army Secretary John McHugh, and other senior officials. He said Lucas has subjugated his own career to support the General's frequent moves over an 18-year relationship. General Taylor was the master of ceremonies for the Pentagon's fourth Gay Pride celebration that showcases a month of gay-themed uh, posters in history. A panel discussion featured a gay Marine officer, a gay Army sergeant who is a criminal investigator, a lesbian chaplain, and a transgender Amanda Simpson who... Uh, is executive director of the Army of Army's Office of Energy Initiatives. What else can you say? Because again, you can't even pray in the name of Jesus in the military anymore if you're a chaplain. Again, I must say, judgment is coming upon America very soon. And it's very sad. Uh... Here's an interesting news story as well. Transgender MMA fighter goes in ring against an actual woman and nearly beats her to death. Again, out of now the end begins. I just cannot believe the state that this country has fallen to. I don't even recognize it. And... All of us who want to stand up for traditional values and for biblical values are seen as intolerant, bigoted haters. And we're all on the list of the Department of Homeland Security's list of potential domestic terrorists because we want to stand up for the truth. Transgender MMA fighter goes in ring against actual woman and nearly beats her to death. Uh, a transgender mixed martial arts competition competitor, Fallon Fox, is facing new criticisms after breaking the eye socket of his last opponent. Editors note, there is no surgery available to change your gender. You are what you are born as. Men who become transgender and convert to being a woman are still men with all the DNA, testosterone, and body strength that goes with it. Allowing a man to call himself a woman and then be allowed to get in a ring and fight an actual woman borders on criminal behavior. If MMA is smart, they'll put an immediate stop to this nonsense right away. But of course they won't, because it's all about money. And the, sixth state, the sad state of affair is the sickness of the American people who want this as entertainment and are willing to pay for it. On Saturday, Fox defeated Tamika Brents by TKO at 217 of the first round of their match. In addition to the damaged orbital bone that required seven staples, Brents received a concussion. In a post-fight interview this week, she told uh, WHOA-TV that I've never been, felt so overpowered in my life. i fought a lot of women and have never felt the strength that I felt in a fight as I did that night. I can't answer whether it's because he's, he was born a man or not because I'm not a doctor, she stated. I can only say I've never felt so overpowered in my life and I'm an abnormally strong female in my own right. His grip was different, she added. I could usually move around the clinch against females, but couldn't move at all in Fox's clinch. Fox's gender controversy is not new. In March 2013, after a 39-second knockout victory, it was revealed that Fox had not told the MMA community about his sex change operation, which took place in 2006. Uh, a video of the Brent's fight taken by the ringside fans, shows Fox throwing several powerful knees to the face and torso of Brents at the start of the match, who pulled guard to protect herself. Soon, Brents turned her back to avoid damage, and where she took approximately 45 seconds of elbow and fist strikes, many blocked by her hands and arms before the referee stopped the fight. Wow. Um, again, now we got this Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner, whatever it is. 
she is, he is, it is, I don't know. But Caitlyn Jenner, <laughs> Olympic athlete, hero to Americans. Now we got this transgender MMA fighting thing. Let's move on. Uh, you know, like I said, America is done. It is time to make sure you know you are right with Jesus Christ. If you are not, repent of your sin, turn to him in faith. We are running out of time. This nation is about to be no more. Um, as I've said multiple times, we're facing judgment from God for things like this, this the LGBT agenda, kicking God out of schools, kicking God out of our government, out of our military, while inviting Islam in, and turning our back on Israel. It's kind of the, the trifecta of bringing the things that will bring on God's judgment, and we're doing all three. Which leads me to this next article. Not a why net news. Uh, U.S. Supreme Court rejects law to allow Jerusalem, Israel, on passports. Uh, so if you're born in Jerusalem on your passport here in America, will not say Jerusalem, Israel, because the Supreme Court is making Jerusalem an international city. It doesn't belong to anyone, according to the Supreme Court. But let's face facts. Jerusalem's the capital of Israel. Always has been, always will be. And in the last days, the entire world will turn against Israel, including her greatest ally, America. And again, it's a sign of impending doom to America. Votes seen as a victory for U.S. President Obama, who claims that law would set a precedent harming his ability to set foreign policy. The U.S. Supreme Court has struck down a disputed law that would have allowed Americans born in Jerusalem to list their birthplace as Israel, on their U.S. passports. It's an important ruling that underscores the president's authority in foreign affairs. The court ruled 6-3 to three Monday that Congress overstepped its, its bounds when it approved the law in 2002. It would have forced the State Department to alter its long-standing policy of not listing Israel as the birthplace of Jerusalem-born Americans. The policy is part of the government's refusal to recognize any nation's sovereignty over Jerusalem until Israelis and Palestinians resolve its status uh, through negotiations. Well, um, let's go to Zechariah chapter 12, uh, verse 2 and 3 and, and 9. Uh, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Again, it's exactly what's happening with Jerusalem. It is certainly a burdensome stone in the world right now. It's a big deal when it comes to this Palestinian-Israeli uh, agreement and the two-state solution. It is definitely a burdensome stone. And in verse 9, God says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now, in the last days at the Battle of Armageddon, the, the ruled armies will encircle Jerusalem to try to, to, to battle. But, uh, you know, they're, they're coming against Jerusalem right now, too, by not, not recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And, uh, and now America is doing that. And... Uh, Wow. Uh, let's go to Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Again, as I said at the beginning of this video, how much longer can we poke God in the eye with a stick before he runs out of patience and judges our nation? Israel is the apple of God's eye. The land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. It was given to them. God promised to return them to it. And he has done that in 1948. And the God's prophetic time clock really went into, into play at that point. And uh, we're almost a full generation from that time period. We're running out of time. Uh, Netanyahu calls on Palestinians to return to the peace talks. Again, you know, for the last three or four years, this two-state solution will not die. 
even though they uh, ended the talks last summer, it's still an ongoing thing where the United Nations and Barack Hussein Obama, John Kerry, the European Union, all na nations around the world are threatening to uh, go to the United Nations and, and, and declare Palestinians, to give the Palestinians a state. So, again, there's these peace negotiations, these talks for peace, the peace negotiations just will not go away. And I believe that's because we're at the time where Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, is about to begin. And the way that week starts, Daniel 9.27, uh, And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And that is, uh, he is the Antichrist. The covenant with many for one week is the covenant that's going to guarantee the security of Israel and seem to bring on world peace and prosperity, but, and this man will be the Antichrist. And he's about to come on the scene. Netanyahu calls on Palestinians to return to talks. Prime Minister says recognizing the Jewish state, not a precondition to, to negotiations. It says world powers have the wrong approach. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Tuesday called on the Palestinians to return to the negotiating table, saying that his demand that Ramallah recognize Israel as a Jewish state is not a precondition. Netanyahu, speaking um, at a conference, added that although he supports a two-state solution, a future Palestinian state would be demilitarized, and Israel would maintain security control of the West Bank area. I call on Mahmoud Abbas to return to talks without preconditions, he declared. He added that Though the Palestinian recognition of a Jewish state was not a precondition for talks, it would form the basis of a lasting agreement. The Palestinians expect us to recognize a Palestinian state, but they won't recognize a Jewish state for the Jewish people. That's what we want, mutual recognition. He complained that Israel had put out its hand to the Palestinians time after time after time, but Abbas had been unwilling to engage in talks. I have tried for six and a half years to have talks, he said, pointed, pointing to the fact that a 10-month settlement freeze in 2009 and 2010 only led to six total hours of direct negotiations between him and Abbas, during which the Palestinian leader only demanded a, larger, more, a longer moratorium on settlement building. Uh, you know, I, I, again, the international community keeps blaming Israel for not having peace. But it's apparent, very apparent, that the Palestinians' refusal to accept Israel as a one Jewish state, forming a unity government with Hamas, who has it in their charter to annihilate Israel, while America is still negotiating for a nuclear uh, program, a nuclear agreement with Iran for their nuclear program, while Iran continues to threaten Israel and call them the little Satan in America, the great Satan. Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel have every right to, to be concerned. But the world is continuing to ignore Benjamin Netanyahu's cries for help and instead continue to blame him for everything. Let's move on. Vladimir Putin met with Pope Francis today. And I'm telling you, the world keeps thinking Pope Francis has all these answers and he's going to perform all these great miracles. And This is out of Time Magazine today. Can Pope Francis work a Vladimir Putin miracle? Wow. You know, Vladimir Putin and Russia are going to attack Israel. The Ezekiel 38, the War of Gog and Magog, Turkey, Iran, which is Persia in the Bible, and Russia, along with Syria and Libya, they're going to attack Iran. Excuse me. They're going to attack Israel. I believe shortly after the covenant with many is confirmed, because Dan Ezekiel 38 talks about how Israel will be living in peace at the time. They'll have their guard down. They're not. They certainly don't have their guard down right now. Oh, but after the covenant with many is confirmed, Russia will attack Israel. Pope Francis. Can Pope Francis work a Vladimir Putin miracle? Um, Christopher Hale wrote this article. Christopher Hale is executive director at Catholics in Alliance for the Common Good and the co-founder of Millennial. 
you're hearing a lot about this common good stuff because it's the one world, the new world order, the one world government, the one world religion that's forming. The Pope can use his partnership with Putin to take the lead in foreign affairs. In line of Pope Francis and Vladimir Putin's meeting Wednesday at the Vatican, it's useful to recall the first meeting between the two in November. The scariest photo of Pope Francis was taken at the meeting, staring at the Russian president from across his desk. The, post, the Pope's demeanor suggested he wasn't afraid of the former KGB officer, officer who has had an iron-fisted rule over the nation for a better part of a generation. Um... Again, let me go back up to the headline. The Pope can use his partner partnership with Putin to take a lead in foreign affairs. The gentleman who takes the lead in foreign affairs around the world will probably be the Antichrist. Wake up, people. Judging solely on the basis of personality, Pope Francis and Russian President Vladimir Putin may seem an odd geo geopolitical couple. Francis is a man of compassion and peace. Don't be fooled. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. While Putin is quite possibly the single rule leader you most wouldn't want to run into in a dark alley. No, I'd probably say that would be Hillary Clinton. Um, when uh, Francis, yet when Francis and Putin meet on Wednesday in the Vatican, it will bring together two figures who forged an improbably strong partnership. Uh, wow. This partnership was originally formed in September 2013 when both Francis and Putin called on the U.S. to not take military action in Syria. Francis and Putin used very, two very different means to communicate their message. Francis had a, held a worldwide prayer vigil for peace, while Putin penned a somewhat audacious editorial in the New York Times in which he cited Pope Francis' objection for a reason for the U.S. to not get involved in the region. Uh... Russia-sponsored media have suggested such partnerships make Putin and Francis champions of similar values. Isn't it odd that I've done an article, a video recently about how Barack Hussein Obama and Pope Francis are almost twins. And now we're reading an article about how Putin and, Fr and Francis champion of similar values. By their fruits you shall know them. We've now compared Francis to Putin... And Obama, yet he's supposed to be the so-called vicar of Christ. He looks nothing like Christ. He certainly does look more like a world dictator. Uh, it says, yet a little more than two years into his tenure, I still think Pope Francis is the best politician in the world. Uh, again, I thought he was a spiritual leader, not a politician. But that's exactly what he is. He's a politician. He's not a spiritual leader. Oh, boy. Uh, twice he's re in his relatively short papacy, he's made significant foreign policy progress. Um, he, he convened an unprecedented Vatican meeting between then-Israeli President Shimon Peres and Mahmoud Abbas to discuss a new way forward between the warring nations. Just a few months earlier, John Kerry said his efforts to do the same had failed. Then it goes into talking about how uh, Francis ushered in a new era of peace and dialogue between the U.S. and Cuba. And President Obama stated in a state of union address credited the Pope with his first crucial role in the process. Uh, and Raul Castro said that Francis keeps going in the same direction he might even pray again and consider to return to the Catholic Church. Well, you can tell that the Catholicism has really influenced... Uh, Raul Castro for, Castro for the better, hasn't it? You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Become born again. Let the Holy Spirit of God regenerate you, forgive you, cleanse you, sanctify you, justify you. Make you more Christ-like by allowing you to <laughs> try to follow Jesus like we, were, like we were only meant to be. And the only way you can do that was with the Holy Spirit in you. Going to church and calling yourself a member of a church does not do that for you. Confessing your sins to a priest does not do that for you. You must be born again. Uh, let's move on. Um, speaking again of Pope Francis, to serve and keep to serve and to keep responding to Pope Francis's call to become protectors of. 
creation. This is all the Huffington Post today. Again, Pope Francis has taken the lead in this whole United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda 21 type program for climate change, uh, calling for the whole world to unite. It says, most of the run-up of Pope Francis's ecology encyclical, due to appear on June 18th, is focused on issues of natural ecology, like the climate change, fracking, and mining. But the encyclical will also call our attention to human ecology and how we treat each other, and its relationship to the environment. Pope calls this in integral, Pope, the Pope calls this integral ecology. An interfaith campaign in the Jordan River Valley illustrates the concept. Eco-peace brings together Jordanian, Palestinian, and Israeli leaders to protect their shared regional environment. By doing so, Eco-peace also promotes the conditions necessary for peace by, here it is again, by organizing sustainable development. Its educational campaign about the environmental challenges facing the Jordan River encourages all people of the region to participate in joint efforts to restore an important spiritual symbol. The interfaith campaign of eco-peace brings Christians, Muslims, and Jews on educational tours of the Lower Jordan River where they learn about the river's religious significance and the Abrahamic traditions. Eco-peace inspires action-based community responses. By showing the environmental reality of the river, it has also engaged religious and community leaders and regional governments in signing and implementing the covenant for the Jordan River, uh, a statement that calls for the restoration of the Jordan Valley. Um, efforts like those of equal peace come at a critical moment in human history. Environmental degradation and climate change have become a focus of concern for people of all faiths worldwide and uh, the Pope is calling for all people of goodwill to become protectors of creation uh, it says this is the third in a series of posts on the encyclical um, by these writers who are engaging Catholic and Jewish communities in our voices the international and multi-faith climate campaign this encyclical, this climate change agenda is being used to usher in the one world government and the one world religion. I'm telling you, it is time to wake up. Yes, we should all do our best to take care of the environment. Having a one world dictatorship forcing things upon you that are not really going to help the situation. Quite frankly, the situation is not what they make it out to be anyway. Uh, well, all right, uh, religious leaders at forefront of fight against intolerance. This is, uh, as the United Nations chief says, religious leaders at forefront of fight against intolerance. Uh, again, what they just declare to be intolerance and what they're talking about when they talk about extremist violence. Again, I need to point out, the evangelical Christians are high on the list of the potential to, uh, threats to security and safety. Pope Francis, again, has recently said that fundamentalist Christians have a sickness. They're dangerous. Even Bill O'Reilly said that not too long ago on the O'Reilly Factor, that fundamentalist Christians are dangerous. If the rapture is delayed, we are going to see some serious, serious stuff. I wholeheartedly support and believe wholeheartedly that the church will not be here during Daniel's 70th week, which is why it's known as Daniel's 70th week. It's why there's a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Not the churches. But if that seventh week, the beginning of that seventh week is delayed, and the, the rate things are going right now with this LGBT agenda and how they're forcing that upon Christians and they're forcing it upon churches, they're, now they're forcing this climate change stuff and their gospel of tolerance. But again, they're not tolerant at all of the Christian belief. 
of the Christian system. They're only tolerant if you, of you if you agree with them. Religious leaders have a pivotal role. Religious leaders have a pivotal role to play in times of turmoil during which they can provide values based glue to hold communities together and provide common ground for peacemaking and problem solving, said Ban Ki moon. Let me stop there for a minute because all oh, that sounds just great. Until you realize that pastors here in America have been being trained by FEMA for periods of unrest to make their churches, make their people fall in line and fall right into the New World Order agenda to obey their government. Sounds so nice and, and peaceful, doesn't it? You can do so by fostering dialogue, by using spiritual authority to encourage individuals to act humanely, and by promoting shared values as enshrined in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and as reflected in the teachings of all world religions. Would that include Islam, who says to behead the infidel? Just wondering. In his opening remarks to a dialogue to promote peace and prosperity in turbulent times, it's not going to be more turbulent times than Daniel's 70th week, time of Jacob's trouble. In fact, that's when Jesus said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as never was before, nor, nor, nor ever shall be, and except those days be short, never should no flesh be saved. Matthew 24, 21, and 22. He says, uh, Promoting tolerance and reconciliation, uh, he reminded you religi religious leaders, both traditional and non-traditional, of their obligation to speak out when so-called adherents of their faith commit crimes in its name. This is a very veiled way of saying, spiritual leaders and pastors you need to help us enforce the New World Order. They must teach their followers to be the true meaning of reconciliation, understanding, and mutual respect. <clears throat> convinced that the scourge of violence in the name of religion calls for concerted action by governments, religious communities, civil society, and the media. <sighs> the brunt of violent... He says, often bearing the brunt of violent ideologies, women and young girls must be provided with a stronger, more equal platform as a means of advancing respect, changing mindsets, and shifting global consciousness. No, it's just hard to even read this stuff because people aren't paying attention. People think, oh yes, definitely, we all want peace. And they're not looking deep enough to see what this is really talking about. They're just willing to give up more and more rights and more and more uh, <laughs> call for, honestly, again, the New World Order. They think that there's going to be some guy with all the answers. That some guy is the Antichrist. Again, all I can say, let's wake up. Uh, let's look at a couple of Obama stories. Uh, the president, by the way, thank you, Brother Hans, for sending me this link to this article. The president once more declares tradition. No, excuse me. This is there's another article. The the last article I'm going to do today. Thank you, Brother Hans, for that one. Here's a different article. The president once more declares. Traditional Christians to be bigots and enemies of the state. Exactly what I've been telling you. The LGBT agenda is going to be used to take all of our Christian rights away from us. The government already considers Christians to be enemies of the state. It's that simple. Once more, President Obama proclaims June to be the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, don't forget transgender, uh, what's that mean, Pride Month. Every federal worker and member of the armed forces received a presidential proclamation in their email. It labels all opposition to homosexual behavior as prejudice, which in fact declares all traditional Christians to be bigots and enemies of the state's ideology of sexual diversity. We celebrate the proud legacy LGBT individuals have woven into the fabric of our nation. We honor those who have fought to, to perf uh, perfect our union, and we continue to work to build a society where every child grows up knowing that their country supports them, is proud of them, and has a place for them exactly as they are. I call upon the people of the United States to eliminate prejudice everywhere it exists and to celebrate the great diversity of the American people. Except you don't have to eliminate your prejudice of Christian values. If you don't like those, you have every right to be offended. 
But if you're a Christian and you're offended by some of these things, like the LGBT agenda, too bad, you're a hater, you're intolerant, you must accept this. Where is the tolerance and peace in that? Proud legacy, it says with question mark, with all due respect to the president. I do not celebrate as a proud legacy the advancement of an agenda that provides incentives for young people to dishonor the creator's stamp of gender by treating their, by treating their maleness or femaleness on, ha on half intact in relation to their own sex, as though they were half males or half females needing to supp supplement their sex structurally through sexual union with someone of the same sex. I don't celebrate as a proud legacy a form of behavior that, owing to the absence of a true sexual complement, and thus a moderating influence on the extremes of... I don't like the way this is written. Sorry. Uh, but I, I get the gist of this. I understand this. Yes, I don't celebrate this either. The Bible makes it clear that this is a sin, it's an abomination, and, and that homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. And as a Christian, I'm going to tell people the truth. I am not in favor of harming or fighting or hurting or even uh, discriminating, I'm not discriminating against any person of any kind. But I'm also very much in favor of telling them the truth. The biblical truth. Then that's between them and God. Uh, and I do not celebrate as a proud legacy the, the uh, attendant deprivation of civil and religious liberties and escalating discrimination against those who rightly believe the scriptures from Moses to Jesus and Paul, the homosexual practice is a sin. It says, assault on our liberties and persecution of our children. What happens when a president uses the bully pulpit and the awesome powers of the presidency to advance the LGP, LBGT agenda both nationally and internationally? Christian organizations could be deprived of federal contracts and grants if they don't uh, practice affirmative action hiring of homosexual Applicants who don't share the Christian values of the organization, members of the armed services, including officers and chaplains, are already required to promote the celebration of sexual diversity or face the prospect of disciplinary action. But again, they're also, if you're a chaplain in the military, as I said at the beginning of this, me of this message, you're also going to be disciplined if you're praying in the name of Jesus. Religious ministries seeking to help persons struggling with same-sex attractions are being banned from helping willing min uh, minors and sued by multi-million dollar LBGT advocacy groups. Uh, more Christian colleges are being threatened with a loss of accreditation if they don't allow LGBT advocates to present their views on campus. Uh, on and on and on. And in fact it says on and on the list goes. And it will only get worse because of the Supreme Court appointees mostly of Obama and Clinton will ensure that gay marriage becomes the law of the land even though such an action is clearly legislating from the bench without constitutional authority. And again as I said this day, this nation's days are numbered. And one more story. Again about Barack Hussein Obama. As you know, that there was a recent uh, controversy about the NSA, the National was it, uh, Security Agency, and their surveillance program and their tracking and of uh, phone, cell phone calls and all that. Uh, Thank you, Brother Hans, for this article. Obama goes full Stalin. Tells secret court to ignore law he signed four hours earlier to, and extend the illegal NSA surveillance. I made this comment to uh, my father, I believe, that uh, it doesn't matter what they say they're going to do. It doesn't matter what the law says. They're going to ignore it anyway. And that's exactly what this article says is happening. It says, just when you thought the absurdity that marks every single day of Obama's reign could not possibly be surpassed, we learn that four hours, it says three hours and 47 minutes to be precise, after the U.S. president vowed to sign a new law banning bulk data collection by the IRS. Sorry, it crashed. Let me get back up here real quick. I'm just gonna, I'll wrap this up real quickly, I promise. All right. Uh, it says, after the president vowed 
to sign a new law banning bulk data collection by the NSA, named for purely grotesque reasons the USA Freedom Act, the Obama administration asked the Secret Surveillance Court to ignore a federal court that found bulk surveillance illegal and to once again grant the National Security Agency the power to collect the phone records of millions of Americans for six months. Um, or as the Guardian's Spencer Ackerman, who spotted this glaring page out of uh, Joseph Stalin's playbook, summarized it. June 12th, June 2nd, 6.03, Obama says he'll sign law uh, banning bulk collection. June 2nd, 9.50 p.m., Department of Justice asks the Secret Court for 180 more days of bulk collection. It's going to keep happening. The surveillance is not going to stop. And they'll use false flag events and whatever they can do to make you keep realizing that you think you need that. You need the government's protection. You need them to spy on everything you're doing. And it's our, right, it's, it's our duty to allow them to do so so they can keep us safe. Why? Because, again, the New World Order is forming. The One World Religion, the One World Government. Soon to be the mark of the beast. No one can buy or sell without the mark. We are getting very, very, very close. All the signs are here that Jesus told us to look for. And contrary to popular opinion, there are not multiple paths to God. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus himself said it in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. <clears throat> For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He will save you if you believe that he suffered and died on the cross, shed his blood for you, and that he rose again from the dead, and ask him to save you. He will You'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. You'll change your heart, give you completely different uh, wants and desires, and you'll, and, and you'll be ready for anything and everything that may come upon this earth. But more importantly, if you were to die, you would have eternal life. You do not want to die in your sin. No one's promised tomorrow. If you die without the forgiveness that only comes through Jesus, you'll wind up in hell for eternity. And because I believe we are absolutely on the verge of Daniel's 70th week, you also do not want to be left behind. Jesus is going to come for his church. You must be born again. You must be ready for when that trumpet sounds. Make sure you're ready and keep looking up. God bless everyone.